I first met Herbert at the movie theater where I worked when I was 17. He was friends with my coworker Paul, and he'd come in and we'd all shoot the shit for hours. We'd watch The Simpsons on the little TV in the office, smoke endless cigarettes and snack on disgusting stale bottomless popcorn, debating the meaning of Jane's addiction lyrics and whether or not spirituality was a pile of horse poo. Paul was a spiritual one, all about karma and reincarnation. He showed us illustrations from a ratty old book of the sun's energy entering a man through his penis, and I laughed like a teenage boy. There's nothing waiting for us after we die, I said. Just blackness and void. Well, as long as we have a pretty view while we're still here, said Herb, staring pointedly at me. I laughed and looked away uncomfortably. I thought he was kind of a dork. A few years later, in the mid-90s, I rode a small pink scooter and I worked at a bank around the corner from the old movie theater. Herbert had a goatee now and rode around on a BMW motorcycle clad in black leather, head to toe. Despite the accoutrement, he still came off as kind of a dork. He developed this annoying habit of greeting me, saying, What's new, pussycat? I didn't know how to respond to such a sexist salutation. So I diffused my discomfort the only way I could think. I sing back to him Tom Jones style. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This kind of became our thing. One day I walked into the print shop where he worked. What's new, pussycat? said Herb. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I said. This is getting old. I had a freshly typed manuscript in my hand and grand aspirations. I'd written a novel, and I was determined to find an agent, become a best-selling writer, and leave my stupid job at the bank behind. When you make it big, don't forget us little people, okay? Herb said. When I came in later to pick up my copies, he winked and told me they were on the house. Eventually, at a tiki party in Herb's apartment's basement, I drunkenly told him how I felt. You know, you've got to stop with the pussycat thing. It's degrading, I said. His face darkened with hurt. He apologized and said, I get nervous talking to girls sometimes. I felt like a dick. He wasn't such a bad guy. He was just struggling like everybody else. Herb got weird as the night progressed, saying stuff like, You've got a path. You've got a future. I don't have a future. You're what, 25, I said? You've got nothing but your future ahead of you. Things will be just fine, I said. You'll see. Maybe a month later, I ran into my old co-worker, Paul, in a crowded, smoky bar on Haight Street. He was sitting with some guys in a little booth in the back of the room. Empty shot glasses littered their table and made it sparkle, and a heavy silence hung over them, a black hole of sound in an otherwise cacophonous scene. They all seemed to be growing goatees. What's with a face fuzz, I asked. It's a tribute to Herb, said Paul. Herbert's dead. Paul told me that Herb had been planning elaborate suicides for years, but every time he'd try to go through with it, one of his friends would track him down and drag him back home. Paul said one time he rode all the way to Montana to Custard's last stand with no helmet on to stop him. Herbert's friends had always managed to save him. Well, until now. This time he managed to put on his best suit. He wrote some letters. He paid for his cremation in advance. How thoughtful, right? He planned on jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge, but it had been raining for days, and it must have been too windy, so instead he just walked into the bay. I've heard that drowning is one of the better ways to die. Your body goes into shock, and after the initial pain and panic, it mellows out. It's like you're back in the womb, a nice full circle. I didn't realize that would be the last time I'd run into Paul. Had I known, I wouldn't have excused myself from the conversation so quickly. I would have asked him more follow-up questions, like, what happened at Custer's last stand? Did Herbert come home willingly, or did you have to drag him away? How would you even do that with a guy on a motorcycle? Why didn't you get him help? Why didn't I try to get him help when he told me he had no future? Perhaps I should have seen it coming, but at 21, I was too green to know the difference between a cry for help and a dark, confusing joke with no punchline. I think of Herbert out in the freezing cold bay, water up to his knees. I wonder which direction he was facing, San Francisco or Marin, before he submerged and crawled back in the womb. I like to think he was facing the city, that the last thing he saw was a pretty view.